Hi, everybody. I'm Jordan Ostroff with Jordan Law, and this is Let's Get Up to Business, our Facebook live show where, where we interview business owners and business service providers and get their expertise on ways that you can help start, protect, and grow your business. Uh, joining us today, an awesome guest, Dale Dupree. If you don't follow him on LinkedIn and you're on LinkedIn at all, you should definitely go in and uh, subscribe. And also, you want to get his email auto reply. Or at least the last one was this like hilarious thing about being at the rebel base offsite and something. It just, it really spoke to me. So Dale, thank you so much for joining us. Dude, that's uh, it's an honor to be here, privilege to be here. And I'm grateful for the invite to come out and hang. So for those people that don't know you, what's, what's your background? What's your, what's your origin story? Let's call it. Yeah. So I come from a marsh. Um, I like ascended from it and I was met by like a tribe of, people that you know that had done a ritual and brought me out <laughs> yeah that's not true so i'm uh, an orlandoian born and raised 1985 right here in orlando florida my story starts a year before though with my father who founded his first and only copier firm so toner was running in my veins when i was born and even though i tried to get away from copiers and all their glory i was sucked back into it after a five six year music stint on Warner Brothers Records where I toured all over the United States. So I came back from that, sold copy machines with my father. I sucked at it terribly for about two straight years of just like constant failure and learning. And, and then I got really good at it. And really what I got good at was that I stopped trying to sell copiers and I started tapping into my inner rebel and understanding that sales is, is a, it's a label if we put one on it, right? That I needed to look at it as relationship building as the integral side of that as well too not just you know building a relationship so i can sell something to somebody but actually serving people from a servant leadership mindset and perspective and just going deeper into a sales existence than just the surface level stuff that we typically do on a daily basis so so i spent 14 years selling copy machines very successfully it was a million dollar producer year over and the number one rep in my organization I became the VP of sales eventually and just kind of got tired of the corporate world and the mindset that most salespeople have and decided that I wanted to start a real rebellion, not just run my own. And now I'm an international sales trainer that uh, founded the sales rebellion back in 2019. I love it, man. And, you know, I feel like copier sales is that stereotypical thing that we view when we think of that salesman like we don't go door to door anymore but now it's like the copier is being that big business sales pitch yeah dude so we don't go door to door anymore but someone was at my door yesterday right so like it's still a thing to some extent and for some people i opened the door and was like is this allowed are you guys allowed to do <laughs> Like without a mask, you're standing really close to my door. You're breathing in my face. Like, thanks, man. I appreciate appreciate the pitch that you've got going on right now. Yeah, and I I train a lot of copier sales reps still. So I'd say about forty percent to fifty percent of our total business and our total students are copier sales reps, and they still go door to door during this time. It, they've had to get a really innovative and it's been so much fun because the creative the creative side of me has come out hardcore. Um, and the students have benefited from it and the collaborations have been amazing, but you know, it's, it's really the last line of defense of sales in my opinion, because being face to face and built is the only way to really build relationships, create rapport and be authentic with individuals, you know, that it's not as easy to do that through email and through video and everything else. So I hope to see it, you know, at least the style of it, you know, infiltrate the rest of the sales world to some capacity where we start being you know, treating, I should say, people from that different perspective that they need to be treated in the first place instead of having to look at sales as just a bunch of scumbags, you know, in the year 2021. So, see, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I feel like, so I feel like attorneys think that sales is that scummy four letter word. And so they don't learn to do it. And then my joke is I tell them they learn the five letter word called broke because they don't know how to sell. And so, you know, it's interesting because I think that we kind of run, we try to run so far away from that perspective that we have that we end up having completely no idea how to actually sell to somebody. I would agree with you entirely. So I guess let, let's start here. When it comes to sales, what are like the big immediate no-nos that like everybody thinks they should be doing? Like what's the don't do this? And then let's talk about what they should be doing instead. 
Yeah, I'd say 90% of what salespeople do sucks and they shouldn't be doing it, you know, because the way that they look at their entire existence from outreach to closing, it's, it's a travesty to, to say the least. And it's, it's not accommodating to the buyer period. You know, there's lots of manipulation tactics. There's, oh, the customer's ghosting you. It's funny how like we've turned someone being extremely busy into this word ghosting, right? That's my favorite part. Like, no, it's not that they're ghosting you. They're just being a normal person and they're super busy and they have other priorities. <laughs> there's, there's more emotion behind these things than we allow to play through in the first place. Instead, we try to give everything a label and we try to create a move for it. And sales trainers for years have made tons and tons and tons of money and sold hundreds and thousands and millions of books playing to this ideology that somehow, because your sales numbers suck, that if you read my ideas and hear what it is that I have to say and implement it, that you'll be better. Now, the problem with that is, is that yes, it, it will work sometimes on the occasion, right? And, and actually, you know, people will, will be million dollar producers using specific teachings from, from people, right? But their legacies are not being built in those moments, right? The ones that they want to be building, right? Instead, they're still going to be the talk of the town in regards to the negative things that come up around their reputation. Oh yeah, that guy treated me like crap. Oh yeah, he's a total liar. He sold me this deal and it wasn't what he said. You know, there's always a second side to the sales cycle from that perspective that we never get to hear. All we do is we meet this guy with $10,000 suit on and you know gold cufflinks and think you must be successful. But that's not the case. So I would tell salespeople in general, you know, that that what they're doing, if they really sat back and analyzed it, is probably wrong. And and I'm not going to say that that's everybody, because there's probably some out there that hear me say that kind of stuff and go, well, don't pick on me. I'm one of the good guys. But that's the thing is that I had to sit back even for myself and recognize that I sucked at it because I was trying to get uh, the the customer to me was a means to an end. I had a quota I needed to hit. I had an annual number I wanted. I had money that I that I desired to make to to create a better lifestyle for myself. And because of that, I disconnected from people altogether and created a process system that was faceless and nameless and just had a dollar signal on it. So the the problem here is that something where people aren't being trained, period, or is that something that people are being trained to do it the wrong way, or is it a mix of both of those things? It's or a mix. It but I would blame it on the 1970s. I would okay. blame it on the boiler room concepts. I would blame it on the, the where sales comes from, you know, outside of the altruistic state of what it truly is and designed to be, which is servant leadership, right? That every salesperson should be a servant leader is the bottom line, because that's what sales is. Sales is service, but sales is also life. I mean, I believe that everybody's in sales. And, and so that's a huge piece of the puzzle as well, too. You know, a teacher sells structure, a broker sells a network. I believe that a buyer sells themselves. But when, until we can tap into that mindset, that it's very difficult for us to understand, you know, what needs to happen in this interaction with this person, because instead, all we really care and think about is this ideology around this thing that we've created a label on sales, right? This is what sales is. This is how it, it, it has to be if you want to make millions of dollars. And it all stems from that, you know, the big push of the, the dial to your dead and the boiler room concepts of, of the early and late 70s that have literally bled into the year 2020. I mean, there are still sales trainers out there talking about, you know, during the pandemic, double your calls. Are you kidding me? I mean, like that kind of stuff is just so disconnected in general, but they make money and they become, you know, more, they get more and more fame from it because they can pay for, you know, pay-per-click ads and Instagram, you know, feed ads because people are foolish in the way that they invest into these terrible ideas. See, it's just so meta because you're talking about the bad sales pitch to sell somebody bad sales pitches for them to sell to, to for them to use. Is it crazy? <laughs> so yeah, and, it, and it, um, it's cool that you mentioned that it's it's something you know a relic of a bygone era type thing because I know um, I listen to Stacy Brown Randall has a podcast called Roadmap to Grow Your Business talks a lot about referrals, so not so much the sales process but the lead gen right. referrals, and she talks about the issue being the 1980s with that same. You know that um that New York City stockbroker always be closing mentality, ask for referrals, demand referrals, and now what she's saying and what you're saying are the same thing. We're really talking about building a, a real genuine human relationship here, and then seeing what comes from that. I mean, am I correct in that? Yeah, I align with her entirely from the perspective of that people have to get back to the business of people and not of products and services, and because those are all tied to outcomes and expectations. But if we tie ourselves to people. 
and we tie ourselves to what the standard of excellence looks like around how we treat each other and how we're serving each other's businesses and the case that we create in the midst of all of that to be able to say, let's do business. Then we're in a more altruistic state that desi is designed to meet on mutually beneficial grounds. Not like, oh, I gave you a great discount, so you should be happy with it or vice versa, right? Where the, the seller gets you know, more commission than, than he did on this deal than the other deal, right? Like it should be a place where everybody feels like they're very well taken care of in those moments. So I, I guess from my perspective, I want to start here and see if you agree or disagree. You have to not necessarily believe in what you're selling, but believe in the problem that it's solving. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that the, the problem solving centric concept around sales is extremely important. I okay. believe that I believe that when we lead from from a sales perspective, when we truly lead, I should say, we're starting with what what segment of the market do I serve and why, right? So I'm an attorney. What I'm in, you know, a state law. I I serve these particular people, and this is why I do it. And the why is really what drives the ideology around the problem, the pain, the illness. And, and we look at it as an illness because we the concept of it at the rebellion is, is that if, if you have an illness, then instead of just like fixing it by stitching up a wound or, you know, carterizing it and causing more pain in the process, in some cases, we prescribe a lifestyle change. We prescribe something that takes that that is more long game centric and focused because we understand that an illness, it needs nurturing and care in order to exit in the first place. So sometimes we have to get a little bit more granular around the illness and say, well, these are the things, these are the steps we have to take, but it's not going to fix it overnight. It's a lifestyle concept. So now I'm entirely in alignment with that thought. I just think that the problem is, is that a lot of times people, they get focused on things like pain and it becomes a gimmick in the process. It becomes a move. It becomes like, oh, you have to get the pain in order to sell something. And that's not always the case. <laughs> Yeah, I love that you talk about that from the standpoint of like the underlying illness, because, you know, I'm dealing with attorneys all the time that's like, oh, I have a problem with a case, you know, I have an issue that's coming up. So let me work harder to solve the problem rather than let me try to prevent that from coming up again going forward. And it sounds like you've got the same thing when you're talking to a lot of these salespeople. Yeah, or even like, you know, giving the salesperson, like in the same instance, giving the salesperson the fix, saying, just change these two things and, and then call me in six months and let me know what happened. And like moving on and allowing them to try to try and find the brilliance that you're leaving for them in regards to like them unlocking their radic radical authenticity and becoming a part of this more altruistic sense of sales. And from the perspective, again, of like how they're serving people and what they're doing wrong because everybody's ignoring them, you know, because your emails suck because they're like a freaking Stephen King novel novel. And there's a follow up book on top of it, which is terrible. Right. But if you can help somebody in those instances, even to just make the change because they don't know how the thing is, is that after they've made it, then they're going to want more. Right. And it's the same way in anything that we're selling that if we have, again, this mindset of how do we serve first? you know, and, and lead first and sell, you know, when our buyer is ready to, to purchase, then we go to a completely different form of the way that it is that we put ourselves out there and the tribe that we attract. Because I'll also say that in the same instance of doing something similar to what I just stated, is that you'll give that free thing away and that person becomes loyal to you in that moment. And they say, wow, this person really truly wants to serve and help me. And, and, and in some cases, and in most cases, I should say it really is that they turn right around and say, how do I do business with you? And they figure it out. So it, it's interesting. So there's a couple of things that I want to unpack. So ideal, let's say ideal client comes to you separate from, you know, a lead magnet or separate from you giving away something for free. You, it sounds like that first step is really to either, you know, break them all the way down or at least see what about them is still going well. Am I correct? I got you, that? fam. I got you, fam. So here's a here's a message I got. This was November 6th. This is great. I just got this this morning, this follow-up. November 6th, this guy writes me and says, Dale, your financial plan is important. Our team, for the first time in 22 years, is offering complimentary financial planning consultations. At the end of the day, you either walk away fully satisfied that what you're doing now is the best, or you have new ideas for value addition to your financial plan. What is a good email to send some information on our team? Like, I mean, listen, there's nothing in there that attracts me to this person or what they sell. And even if I am in the midst of like a weak moment where I'm thinking, yeah, I do worry about my finances every once in a while, there's still someone in my head that like has knocked on my door or shake, shook my hand or knows one of my friends that I'm going to probably call before this person. So here's how I responded. 
I would change your approach to pitching people, Josh. This is a little disconnected from what people desire, and it only makes people want to say yes or no. And because of that, it doesn't elicit any kind of emotion. Nobody reads this and says, oh my God, yes. <laughs> and although that's sarcasm, it's the problem. So I gave him this whole little spiel on what he needs to do, right? And he wrote me back and said, you know, it was funny because it was like, I like your critique. You should write up what I should be saying to people. I was like, buddy, people pay me to do that. <laughs> but have fun doing it yourself, right? But I, but I, I carried a dialogue with him and gave him what he needed to do. So this is what he wrote me today. I love this message too. It's so good. He said, came across you again on here. Ha ha. How have you been? And then immediately said this afterwards. Looks like your version, I'm sorry for your listeners if you're not allowed to use language, but he says half assing it because I told him that that's what he was doing. Got us $14 million in net new assets since we last spoke. This is how I responded. Good for you. Just imagine what would happen if you stopped half assing it. <laughs> he could pull that <laughs> for $28 million. Yeah, right. And, then, and, and I talked to him. I, I told him, I said, and again, I said, I reiterate again, this is the things that I would do. And I, I pushed the, the narrative one more time. And he said, I like you and you're right. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's hiring a marketing agency to help him with these things now. You know, he'll most likely need sales training at some point too. And I got a foot in the door there. Again, people come back to you for these, in these instances, in these moments, because they don't know how to do it themselves, right? Like, just like, I don't know how to fix my plumbing. Even if you showed me how to do it, I would literally never, ever try myself because it's not something that I desire to do. It's not something I went to school to do. It's not something that I want to do for the rest of my life. It's just something I need this moment right now because it's broken, right? And, and so helping somebody though in those instances, like saying like, hey, instead of coming out and charging you a hundred bucks to fix your leaky pipe, I'm going to put you on FaceTime. I'm going to show you exactly what to do real quick. Okay. You ready? Like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then, you know, I can do a couple of things this person tells me. And after that, I'm extremely loyal because I go, well, how much do I owe you? Don't worry about it. You're welcome. And as soon as anything happens, like a person says, yeah, my sink has been clogged. I go, I know the guy. Right. I know the guy. And he's going to do such good things for you. Like I suddenly have a whole new way that I look at that human being and it goes beyond the fact that he's a plumber. It's that I know that he has good integrity, good morals, and he'll take care of my tribe and the people that I love too. Yeah, my uh, my all-time favorite car insurance person was the person who told me, don't change the insurance you currently have. I can't get you better coverage for or a better rate or anything along those lines. Just stick with it. And, uh, you know, let's grab coffee. And I was like, fantastic. That is like the ultimate, that is the ultimate sales pitch. Like I, you, it's not worth you giving me your money, but let's have, let's share some time. So I'm with yes. you. See, yes. now I need you, I need you to start like a YouTube channel where you go through your conversations with bad LinkedIn sales pitches and like where that goes. And then we can like drama, we can dramatize some of the reenactment of the conversation. I've had people sign up for coaching afterwards so like it's gotten really deep but then sometimes it's really funny because they try to argue right like one guy was writing me this is totally off topic right but one guy was writing me and it was just so bad and i i he said hey i see you know so and so and he just put the first name right i have fifty thousand connections on linkedin and only 10 of them ten thousand of them are direct like the rest are just people that follow me so i'm like okay karen all right. Yeah. Let me search Karen in my friends list here. Like I have 50,000 Karens in my friends. List, right. Like, so I wrote him back and just said, I said, I don't know her. Is what I said, unless you give me a last name. And then he, he says, Karen this. And I said, oh, okay, cool. I don't know her either. She's probably <laughs> just one of my followers. And then he, and then he responds to me and says, He's like, he's like, sorry to inconvenience you. He's like, I, I just was asking to connect with you on LinkedIn, not marry you. Right. And I, and I, I wrote him back pretty precisely on this one too. I was like, well, then don't lie to me about why you want to connect. Right. And I think that's the problem in sales that everybody loves the little white lie. Everybody loves to throw this little thing in there that some sales coach told them or some marketing or brand coach told them that they spent way too much freaking money for in the first place. And so they're trying to make it work because they're like, no, I paid for this and I learned this. And this person told me it works and they try, 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 and it never, ever comes to the fruition that they desire. Even this guy that's like, we got 14 million, you know, more assets. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like I can do that too, sending crappy messages like you do. But the point being, I think more than anything that, 
when it comes to sales outreach in general, the way we treat people is that we have to get rid of a lot of the stereotypes. There's so many of them, right? And, and one of them right here in this instance being this whole concept of like trying to get somebody to listen to you by lying to them up front, like right away, you know? And like, we could go deep and deep into this subject, right? Because people in our everyday life do it. Right? It's not just salespeople, it goes pretty far. You know, a lot of times we do it in order to like stay away from drama or we do it in order to have, to not have to have a hard or tough conversation, right? But those are the things that drip into our sales walk over time, you know, whether it's generational and like our whole family is a bunch of liars, right? Or, you know, it's something that we've developed because we're afraid of what we might find if we tell the truth. See, it's so interesting you mentioned like those white lies that we all tell because like the last time I went to go buy a car, you know, the salesman comes out, he's like, hey, you're here to buy a car. And I was like, no, I heard Infinity had, you know, the best cookies in town. Somebody told me to come by. And legitimately, he thought I was being serious because I don't know, maybe other people have lied about that. I was like, no, of course, man. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm here to buy a car. And he was just like so taken aback that I was honest about it. I'm like, I don't understand. Like, what? what other option like you walk around and you're like man you know like it's one thing to go test drive a tesla but like are you really going around like man i gotta go check out that new toyota blah 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 but it's yeah. true i guess you know you, there's that life lesson that somebody was like you know never let the salesperson know you really have to buy a car that day keep the leverage but it works in both directions yeah yeah and like think about how that salesperson is taught right dude like that salesperson is taught that like your buyer lies to you and they're trying to take advantage of you and they're shopping you like crazy and they create enemies out of people that are supposed to be, you know, defended, right, as allies. And, and we do it on both sides, like salespeople do it to themselves, buyers do it to themselves. But, but I, I blame salespeople in most cases because it's us that should be setting the precedence and we should be rising above the mediocre. But the thing for me, though, is isn't everybody a salesperson? Like at the end of the day, the entire concept of communication is to have people do things ideally it's for their benefit and your benefit, but like, ultimately that's the entire point of conversation. Agreed a hundred percent. You know, it's it. And I have that in my book. It's like in the, in the introduction, it says, you know, that, that me personally and the entire rebellion that we believe that everybody is in sales and that the pages that unfold before you are about life, <laughs> you know, and about the interactions that you have on a daily basis and, and what it is that you love to do and are trying to build because that's the thing about it that a lot of people just kind of stay away from in general and don't get sucked into for themselves is like the passion that they're supposed to have with what they do. Instead, they say, oh, I can be in sales and make a ton of money. And because of that, they never got connected to, to the, their own roots and they were never intentional about connecting with their own roots. And they were never so they have bad foundations because of it. They have foundations that are built on, oh, I'm here to get rich. And so everything becomes that every interaction, every moment, every choice, it all becomes this thing that's very self-serving, self-seeking, and that you can't take to your grave, right? You know, the only person that parks their boat, you know, in their mansion behind their gravestone is an asshole. And that's all there is to it. So what, I, I mean, look, obviously, I think this is one of those, like, you have to enjoy the journey. It's a lifetime of the experience to be better with these things, to understand people better, you know, all those what are the what are the quick takeaways? I mean, what are what are things that people can start working on right now to be better at this in ten minutes, in six months, in five years, in you know everything? Yeah, the first thing that I always tell people is like upfront. You know, most people want to know like how do I get more leads? That's always the question. How do I get more leads? How do I get more prospects? How do I build more business into my pipeline? So the first thing that I would always tell salespeople from a, an altruistic standpoint of the foundation that they need to lay, right? From an actionable concept, right? Because I also believe in this un understanding and awareness concept as well too, but that's some hocus pocus stuff that, you know, most people need to like sit with me and listen for a solid hour to understand, right? Because it's very spiritual. But when it comes to the sales portion of it itself, I would say that creativity is the number one thing that makes a salesperson successful outside of the fray, right? The fray being the normal person that picks up the phone and down says, hey, Mark, this is Dale Dupree over the Sales Rebellion. We're the number one sales training company in the world. We've got all these references. Your neighbors use us. I'd love to spend 15 minutes and tell you a little bit more about our systems, how we can make your people more efficient in their sales walk. Well, that call happens so often and so many times that it doesn't create any curiosity. So the number one thing that salespeople can do different is cause and stir curiosity. We call it undeniable curiosity in the sales rebellion. So earlier, Mark was asking me if the Copier Warrior website was still live. It's not, but anybody listening can go to copierwarrior.com and see exactly what I used to send people to as a landing page when I was selling copy machines. And I'm telling you right now that you'll laugh, 
Um, you might pee your pants a little bit even, so be careful. And then you'll you'll look at it and go like, I've never had a copier person calling me like this. I promise you, because I thought outside the box and I, I chose legendary and I decided that I wanted to cause that simple emotion of curiosity up front because with curiosity, there are other things that are tied to it. One is familiarity. So when we're familiar as a buyer with something that's happening, we become more trusting in that moment. And we think, okay, I know this to some extent and I'm, I'm listening, I'm open to it. Right. Well, we we stay so far away from emotions in general as salespeople because we believe it leads to you know the end of the road, and that's not the truth. So getting somebody curious enough and then creating familiarity is what works. So here's a tangible line that people can use, and there's a million of these right out there in the sales world, but this is how rebels do it. Hey, Mark, Dale Dupree with the Sales Rebellion, and you're probably expecting me to start telling you about how my company is number one in the world, that we have the best sales training ever, and all these references that you can call that are going to gloat about me, blah blah blah, because Every single salesperson that calls you does something similar. Am I right? And start a dialogue. A dialogue around a familiar pain that people uh, have to deal with with salespeople, not your product, just the interaction, creates familiarity. And that familiarity can build because now they're very curious to what you do, right? Okay, well, what do you do, right, is the next question out of their mouth. And you can build on that from a storytelling methodology, right? So. So, you know, that that would be like my big picture perspective for people that are trying to like break into more sales and to be better as a salesperson. But again, like to me, what's most important are the foundations, self-awareness, this understanding of who it is that you intentionally want to serve, what you want to build, what it looks like in 50 years from now. And, and having this legacy concept inside of your sales walk more so than just how do I pitch better? How, see, that brings up a really interesting question because from that perspective, how different is it when you're going B2C versus B2B? I mean, it sounds like that's a great opener for somebody out of business who's getting pitched all day long. Is it that much different for a consumer? Absolutely. So imagine like, so, so let's, let's look at it like this. Okay. So, so it's, it's different, but there's like a nostalgia in the way that, that people understand a sales pitch. Okay. So, so let me tell you what I mean by this, that, or let's, let's even just do an example everybody raise their hand that's been called by a realtor and asked like, Hey, are you selling your home right now? When it's not even for sale, right? Just like it's happening. Holy like crap, dude. Three hours ago? <laughs> happens all the time. They say the same thing every time. Right. Well, imagine that the next realtor that calls you changes the pitch and he creates familiarity and he's proactive and he causes curiosity. So proactive being the pitch I, I gave you earlier, where it was like, hey, listen, I'm with this local real estate agency and I know that you're expecting me right now to ask you, are you selling your house and all this other garbage that you don't care about in the first place? Am I right? And in the moment of doing that, I'm going to be like, okay, yeah, like yesterday. Me. Yes. Somebody yeah. just did that yesterday to me, today for you, right, bro? So, so conceptually, again, like it is very different in that the story has to unfold in a different way because this is, it's a much more personal choice in those moments than it is like in B2B, it affects multiple people, right? It affects departments, it affects people that are in charge of that product, it affects people that are the end users of that product. Whereas in a retail setting and B2B or B2C setting, real estate, attorneys, right? It's, it is much more basic. I hate to say it that way, but it's much more basic. All we have to do is connect with the person right here. And because of that, it, it becomes something that simplistically, if we just change some very small things, we will fly through the roof. I have a rep, Tyler Peppers. He sells um, health insurance. He's one of my mentees. I met him through the UCF Professional Selling Program, Go Knights. And when he Start first off. started with me, he was having a little bit of a hard time kind of catching momentum and catching fire, but he saw the money that he could make. I changed his script. I don't even know. It was like a centimeter of an inch, bro, if you were to measure it, right? It was just a tiny tweak in the way that he stated what it was that he was doing and the questions that he was asking. He became the number one rep within the next four months. And again, because like you can have that kind of success when you're dealing directly with one person that makes the decision and nobody else is involved or affected, right? So again, also, dude, I think what we want to take into this is people are listening is that the person might have a spouse, right? They might be, they might own the estate, right? But, but somebody else might live in it. There's a lot of little things in there as well too. But again, it still affects numero uno inside of those decisions 99% of the time. There might just be some little overlap of, of one or two people that also have to go with the flow, but not, you're not talking about entire corporations, budgets, or losing your job over decisions like that. So, so I'm sorry, I guess I lost you a little bit there. 
So are you saying that the B2B sale is easier than the B2C sale because you've got more people behind it or it's harder or it's easier because you're dealing with the same kind of person at every business over and over again? B2B is much more complex is what I'm saying. Okay. Much, much more, more complex, right? Multiple decision makers, boards of directors, you know, a guy that's been doing it the same way for 25 years, a team that wants him to make change so badly, but the, but he can't, he just doesn't want to because it, because it's his choice, right? More so than anything else, right? So there's there's just a lot of complexity to it as opposed to a life insurance guy calling me right now and trying to pitch me, right? And doing it the right way. So it's it's just a big... It's a big gap there, right? For for the most part, but we again we treat sales. It's the same lane, dude. That's how people look at it. They look at it as the same lane. Now, again, like I'm not telling you when I gave the pitch concept, right? I didn't tell you to do it any differently, though. It's all in the mindset. It's all it is, right? So the pitch is the same. The, the sales style is the same. It's just the conceptualization of like romanticizing the future relationship with that person. When it's a company. The people are important, right? That make the decision. But what's even more important are the 50 people that use your product that don't even get a say in the decision, right? right. Whereas with an individual that's buying a service or selling their home, it's usually just one person, right? Maybe a spouse that's involved. And because of that, it's a much different concept of a sale. But we try to take them through the same system. And that's the problem, right? More so than anything is that everybody is unique from that perspective as well, too, that I think people need to hear is that you can't run ABC company and XYZ company through the same system, just the same, right? Just like you can't call every single person and say, hey, are you selling your house and expect them to actually respond positively unless they're caught in a weak moment or and that it would be the individualization like this person needs you right now. It doesn't mean that you're doing it right. <laughs> it just right. means that that person was caught in an emotional crossroads and you hit them. See, but then that also brings up the difference between the needs that can be resolved reactively and the needs that can be resolved proactively. You know, if yes. you've got that person selling life insurance or the financial advisor, you know, that's going to be something that they can sign up with you in theory, anytime over the next 30, 40, 50 years. But obviously, you know, earlier is better. If you've got like, I don't know, hypothetically, somebody who's got a no car accident, you know, they may need an attorney within the first 10 days. They definitely need a, a doctor within the first 14 days. There's some issues with that. So, I mean, that has to kind of accelerate that relationship, no? It accelerates the time frame of which the buyer is making their decision, yes. But the long game has to be played in every interaction that we have with people from a sales perspective. We have to always be playing the long game. So you have to look at the person that like just got in a car accident and needs you right now, and you can't rush yourself into like signing it up. You have, you have to, in your mind, treat this person as if they're about to get married to you for the next 30 years in that moment that that is the compassion side that is the intentionality you know behind a good salesperson's agenda right and and those are the moments where someone can feel in the, in the instance of like giving you the business feel very comfortable with it and not have remorse and not give you two stars at the end of the process right because you can also gauge whether or not that person is 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 serious about doing business with you in those moments as well too as you're offering services and as you're working through the process so I think really it's just the buyer's decision more so than the seller's decision in that in that instance. Like when are they going to buy is up to them. Some of it sooner than later, right? But it doesn't make the way that we treat people any different. We should always have urgency when in sales, no matter how we look at it, right? Always have urgency. But urgency doesn't mean that we're trying to sign the person up right now, this moment. Urgency is just the agenda of the buyer. Where are they at? And how quickly do I need to be responding to certain requests that they're putting in while also making sure that they know that I'm here until I retire or I just stop working altogether because I died. <laughs> See, it, it's interesting because then I go back to thinking about like the subscription model, you know, like in essence, Netflix has to resell you on staying with Netflix every month, as opposed to, you know, like if you bought a lifetime subscription or something, you know, like inherent in the sales cycle is the need for you to constantly be in the customer appreciation cycle as opposed to, you know, like a one and done sale. Is that something that you see a big difference of for your salespeople or not as much? Yeah, I don't, I think it's interesting, right? The subscription side is interesting because I just don't think anybody does it right. Like, and if you're talking about Netflix, they have no competition, right? Like you could say that Hulu is their competition, right? But like they take advantage of what they have. And at, one, at some point they're gonna be done, right? Just like Blockbuster, right? They're, the guys they took out, you know, like <laughs> it's gonna happen to them too if they're not careful. So even in subscription models, like I actually like the identity of saying you re-sign with me every month instead of saying you re-sign with me every year, because that gives me this identity around like, well, they only make nine dollars. 
a month. So they're not really like making money off me. So that what they want and their whole goal is to get me to stay for 12 months, but they don't force me into that, which is a, a, an emotion that we feel when we're, whether we know we are or not, it's an emotion that's coming up in those moments. It could be sitting in the back burner, right? But it's there. No matter how you look at it, it's, it's being pulled out in that, in that particular instance of us like clicking the button to pay monthly for a subscription service, right? So, but I do think that from there, it's about consistency and communication. It's about building that, that rapport through trust and credibility by providing familiarity, by, by making it fun, right? By making it curious, by making it creative. All those things are a huge piece of the puzzle, right? But like, again, like right now, like Net, Netflix goes up against no, you know, HBO and, and people that provide movies. I mean, hell bro, I can't think of any of them other than piracy on the internet. You know, like, they, like a movie theater is not really somebody that's up against a Netflix, you know? So there's also that mindset of like exclusivity too, right? From an inclusive standpoint, anybody can have this, but we're the only people that provide it. Right. So that that's the innovation mindset of a, of a really good sales oriented organization to begin with. So then so then that kind of leads to this question. Um, so if you're the salesperson and I mean, then they go to an account rep, they go to a customer service rep, something along those lines. Are you are you teaching your salespeople to stay in touch with the client? Or are you teaching your salespeople to trust the rest of the team or are you teaching the entire organization to have those similar themes? the whole way through? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I can't stand those models, dude. Like, they just because nobody does them right. Because the right way to do it would be to leave the sales part. Like, let's say you have an SDR, BDR, AE, and then a customer success person, right? So you got a person at the front that kind of finds the deal. Then you got a person that does all the presentation closing, and they got a person that runs with it from there. The buyer is going to look at that system, and they're going to they're going to say they're going to find favor or dissatisfaction within it, number one, right? So doing it well, is the only way to do it well, I should say, like that really retains people is by having somebody at the front and the middle and the end that are part of a team, literally. So they're copied in on the emails, whether they need it or not, right? You know, and, and, and again, there's a lot of ways to automate this kind of concept in a way that like doesn't fill a BDR's email up with a bunch of crap that they don't need in the first place. It's the semantics, right? It's the identity. It's it's somebody saying like these three people take good care of me. Hey, I'm gonna be the BDR. You're gonna have an SD, you're gonna have an AE that's gonna help me present everything for you. And then I'm gonna pass you to Karen. And the three of us work together very closely. Our Can kids hang out in the park every once in a while, you know. What what you, the acronyms, what those stand for? Uh, so sales development rep or business development rep. So okay. so essentially like up front, a BDR or a business development rep is only there to kind of hunt and to qualify the business. Once it's been qualified, they find an interest that goes to an AE, which would be an account executive, who are the closers, essentially, and then over to a customer success person. I think that that model is disconnected. It's why people go to Amazon to buy things, because they don't have to deal with a person at all, and let alone three, right? So I think a lot of the time, we do this to ourselves in most, in most instances. I like the idea, though, of having two functioning reps, you know, one that kind of at the forefront hunts and farms and kills or hunts and kills. And then one that farms, right. Is the identity of that where they can stay intimate inside of that kind of an organizational structure as well too, with the client and still build rapport, you know, cause there's silly stuff you can do. Like you can do a Christmas card that doesn't have to come from the company. It can come from the branded identity of the salesperson of you and the SDR, you know, like rubbing shoulders, pointing at the camera with your silly Christmas hats on saying like, Hey, thanks for doing business with us. And a person that receives receives that as opposed to like Netflix wishes you a Merry Christmas is going to be the one that stands out the most because we identify as humans with other people more so than we do a brand or, or anything for, from that perspective from when you look at four walls because inside of it it's empty without people without the emotion that they bring to it the creativity the vulnerability all the things that we love and cherish as consumers. See, now I want to do 40 minutes on the intersection of that personal, that team brand, not just the personal brand, but creating that, but we're not going to have time for that, unfortunately. Dude, we got to, uh, we got to get you back on. This is great. I, um, you know, I, I, the part I love about this podcast is how much I learn. And so this is definitely one that I've learned quite a bit from. Um, so let's do this, you know, as, as we get towards the end of this, hopefully the, uh, the beginning of several episodes, what how can people stay in touch with you? Where can people go to download some more information about you? How can we get people on that process to being a true sales rebel? 
Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you asking that and letting me share. So salesrebellion.com is the best place to go to find a lot of the information about the organization. You can hit the coaching button up in the corner and either head to our products page or our coaches page. So I'm not the only coach inside of the rebellion. I'm just the leader of the sales rebellion. So I have 10 other coaches that are also on staff as well, too, all with different specialties. And they've all got their own brand that I was just preaching about. Uh, there's some video on there if you want to check out, learn more about us as well, too. But if you like content, linkedin.com backslash IN backslash copier warrior is my personal page on LinkedIn. I post content daily. But you can also find me on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, anything. It's just at sales rebellion or backslash sales rebellion, um, anywhere you're searching. And you can find content from me in any of those platforms. It's all different. It's all insightful. It all comes from the heart, you know, and, and I don't have a lot of BS inside of my content. So it's raw. It's real. Sometimes it hurts a little bit, but that's okay because getting you uncomfortable is important for your growth. So that's the, that's the best way to find me. Or um, you could just send a carrier pigeon out. I think you can put my name like with it and they just know me. The pigeons just know me. They just show up and they poop all over my deck. It's awesome. So. But the pigeon has to carry a crumpled letter. It can't just be a proper scroll. It needs that nice. little extra. Nice. nice one. Nice one. Yeah, no, as somebody who gets, so the Florida bar gives out all the attorney's emails to literally everybody who asks with no hesitation. Um, so, so as somebody who gets pitched like literally seven, 10, 15 times a day, um, I highly recommend everybody go follow you on LinkedIn and learn better ways to do it, but also the chance to like vent in a productive manner about how much it sucks to get those stupid pitches over and over again. And I think the next LinkedIn pitch I get, I'm going to engage in a conversation and uh, push them your way. Cause I just think that's too funny. Awesome. I appreciate that, bro. All right. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks man. Appreciate you.